All right. So what we are going to do is to uh, continue the discussion last time. And last time what we saw was that, well, the notion of black hole really does need general relativity. Uh, Newtonian gravity and Newtonian mechanics are conceptually uh, insufficient to talk about black holes. There are no black holes in Newtonian gravity and Newtonian mechanics, in spite of the claims made in the early days uh, by Mitchell and Laplace and these people. Um, the, other, uh, uh, the, uh, the other point I just told you was that how surprising it is that in fact, um, uh, whereas if you look at static stars, they can have a lot of multiple moments, they can be oblate, prolate, but a static black hole, the uniqueness theorem says that it is really just a short chill black hole, so it really is spherical symmetric. So static non-rotating black holes are uniquely known, and similarly, rotating black holes in four dimensions are uniquely known to be curved solutions. As I emphasized, there are many, many solutions which are, for, which are static gravitational fields, which are not spherical symmetric, and similarly, there are many, many solutions um, of vacuum equations which are not curved, which are uh, stationary and axisymmetric. Okay? Uh, so we, we saw that last, you know, in, in detail last time. So therefore, please don't think that curve is a unique solution. If you have a star, it is not, the exterior field is not represented by, by the curve metric in general. In fact, one does not know how to fill the curve metric with a perfect fluid solution. So this is what we saw last time. And now what we want to do is to, we wrote down also the for the Schwarzschild metric, and I told you a little bit about how big confusion there was for decades about the singularity structure. So again, historically, this is not how Schwarzschild wrote down the metric, but soon after that, the metric was written as um, 1 minus 2 and more r, and if we are squared in a spherical symmetric form, uh, plus uh, d squared plus um, d r squared, uh, squared more r, times, times angular, Unit two sphere line element, which is just sine squared theta uh, d theta squared plus <coughs> sine squared theta d phi squared. By the way, I did mention before that I know that people in mathematics may find some other things too heuristic and may not be may not have some issues with it. So please don't hesitate to ask questions for clarifying. Do you mean this or do you mean that, etc. So this is the form of the metric, and we see immediately here that r is equal to zero, uh, sorry, r equal to n, where a problem. The metric becomes undefined, this coefficient vanishes, so metric is degenerate, this coefficient blows up, so the metric is not at all well defined, and this for the longest time was known as the Schwarzschild singularity. And now, why is it so difficult in general relativity uh, about where is the singularity. But I, as I also told you last time that this is not the case. There is no problem at r equal to 2m. And we're going to see this in great detail next time. Um, but the question is really, what is the singularity? Why is there a problem? I mean, why can't we? So there are two issues here about what is singularity. The first is uh, that consider, for example, Maxwell fields. And if, in fact, we can just look at the uh, FAB, this is the, um, the, the maximum field tensor. These are space-time indices, right? FAB up here. And if, in fact, components, if components of this FAB in a Cartesian chart if the components of FAB in a Cartesian chart diverge, then we know that it is singular, that the Maxwell field is singular. This is clearly you know, something that we can just say, that, well, that's a singular solution. There's no, no two, two ways about it. These are Maxwell fields in Minkowski space, I should say. But our problem is that we don't have Cartesian components. We don't know what good coordinates are a priori in general relativity. In, in, the, in, the, in the Minkowski space-time, space-time is, is given to you, and we know what Cartesian coordinates are. So the first problem that comes up is what are the no preferred coordinates. So even Minkowski space, we could use some 
some some chart, some coordinates which are related to the Cartesian coordinates by singular transformation. And if in that coordinates F E B blows up, we are not concerned. We say, well, it's a problem with the coordinates, not with the field strength. We should look at the components of a good chart. But what do you mean by good chart? What do you mean by good coordinates? Is something that we do not know um, in, in terms of intuitive. That's the first core. And the second thing, which is common to everything else, uh, all fields, is, some, is, the, is the fact that we now have space-time structure. And in space-time structure, the metric is of indefinite signature. So one might imagine that what I could, should do is to look at, to avoid the components, one often says that what we should do is to look at uh, invariance. So we could look at invariance, for example, FAB, FAB, or FAB star FAB. So FAB, FAB is just E squared minus B squared. In a Cartesian coordinates, it will be just, I mean, with, but if you give a slicing of space time to space and time, you define electric magnetic field, it will be just E squared minus B squared. Um, and the problem here is the following, that namely, if I just look at this, this invariance, then this is not a positively definite quantity. And therefore, it could happen that E blows up and B blows up, but E squared minus B squared is perfectly fine. And therefore, just looking at curvature invariance, you cannot determine what is actually singular, singular behavior or not. And in particular, in, in, in gravity, we do have solutions in GR with singularities. for which all curvature invariants vanish. So it's like E equal to B in this case. So in general relativity, you have got a Riemann tensor, and we can have, y, we can have solutions to, uh, to Einstein's equations. There are solutions to Einstein's equations, which are, which are kind of given, which are explicitly known, which are, you know, there is a genuine curvature, but in which all curvature invariants vanish, uh, and yet there are singularities in a sense that we'll, we'll, we'll discuss as we go along. And therefore, these are, this is a problem. The problem is basically you cannot look at components because there are no preferred short coordinates, and you cannot look at invariants by themselves because, the, because of the indefiniteness of the signature. So I'm going to give you some trivial examples to, to see what one does. So if you're given a metric, you ought to know, is there a singularity or is there a chord in the artifact? That's what we want to know, right? And so let's do very simple examples. These are mathematical examples. So let's start with the Riemannian signature, plus plus signature. And for reasons that will become clear in a minute, we're going to look at just two dimensional metrics. So the first example is just look at the metric in which the S squared is equal to dx squared upon x to the fourth plus dy squared. Take this as a simple example. And now it's clear that the metric is bad at x equals 0. Therefore, let's suppose that x is in 0 infinity, this is your manifold, and y is in minus infinity to infinity. So it is a half plane, there is a manifold on which there is a metric. And anybody who looks at it says, oh yeah, this metric is singular, singular clearly at x equals 0. But this is not really the case, because I can just define a new coordinate, x tilde, to be equal to 1 upon x. And then dx tilde is equal to 1 upon x squared times um, dx. And therefore, when I take the square, I just find that ds squared is equal to dx tilde squared is dy tilde squared. Okay. So this metric is just a flat plus dy squared. This metric is just a flat metric in the x tilde y tilde coordinate. But of course, x tilde now goes from uh, 0 is, um, uh, so x tilde would be equal to infinity up here. Uh, x tilde equal to uh, x equal to 0, so x tilde would be infinity. Yeah. So this goes from infinity to 0, so it also goes from 0 to infinity. It goes from infinity to 0 up here, it also goes from infinity to 0 to infinity. And all, what has happened is that the singularity that we had at x equal to 0 is just moved to x equal to infinity. So nothing much has happened yet. But if we look at this metric and we say that, well, wait a minute, why are you so silly 
and restricting x tilde to go from zero to infinity, then the metric is clearly well defined you know, for negative x values. So we can now extend. So this is the new thing. Up to now, I just didn't do anything. I just wrote down the metric in another coordinate. But this suggests now that we extend space time or extend the manifold. And we extend it so that x tilde now takes values into minus infinity to infinity. So if it takes values from minus infinity to infinity, now we are in good shape, right? Because <coughs> now the metric is completely flat, and clearly now the new manifold is larger than the bigger manifold, right? So, so the metric is now. So the, the the interesting thing is that what happened here? Well, if I go to from x tilde to minus infinity to infinity, what happened to x? If you like. So previously we thought that the problem was really at x equal to 0. But in fact, the problem really was at x equal to infinity. Because, uh, sorry, x equal to infinity. Because at x equal to infinity corresponds to x tilde equal to 0, and we could actually extend it beyond that. So counterintuitively, the problem was at x equal to 0. Uh, sorry, x equal to infinity, not x equal to 0. So, x equal to 0 just is shift, shift, move to x tilde equal to infinity, and then the metric is, you know, that is, is defined perfectly fine. So that is where the problem was. And we could also see it. And the check for this is we can look at geodesics of the metric, of this DS of the metric. So this is an exercise. So anytime there's an exercise, the people, especially people who are taking it for credit, should really do it. You calculate the geodesics of this metric that we are given, given to you. That will be trivial to calculate if you go to this, this coordinates if you like, but you can calculate also the old coordinates up here. And you will see that that or the old manifold is incomplete. In other words, we got geodesics which run their, their length is finite, and yet the geodesic terminates in this chart up here. And therefore, what we are, all we have done is that, well, no, no, we just extend the geodesic. We just extend the manifold. We got a bigger manifold. And what we are seeing now up here is that, in fact, the old manifold was small. The bigger manifold, everything is well defined. And that manifold is just flat. So that is the first example. It's a very trivial example, but it tells you that we should really look at something like geodesic completeness. So this is the important part point that we're going to look at. Um, so new manifold is we say it's complete. And one measure of a singularity is really that if we cannot do this extension, if the metric is such that the space-time manifold cannot be extended, and some geodesics are really incomplete. And that is when we say that there is a singularity. So that is a general idea. So let us take a second example. This second example is, is, um, is, um, is even simpler. Uh, it's just given by dx squared. Uh, it's just given by x squared, dx squared plus um, Let's do y squared. And again, x is 0 to infinity, and y is minus to infinity. So the second example is, is this metric up here, and the range of coordinates is given up here. And again, it might look like there is a problem at x equal to 0, but just staring at it, we see that there is really no problem. Uh, we can just define x tilde as a new coordinate to be x x squared divided by 2, and then the metric is just given by dx squared is equal to uh, dx tilde squared, dx tilde squared, x tilde is again from 0 to infinity. So again, nothing has happened, it is just up here. But now, we see again that the manifold can be extended. So we extend the manifold, this is a non trivial step. And 
And if we extend the manifold to that, then we have just obtain x to that minus infinity infinity. And again, you can see that this new manifold is geodesically complete. So this is something that people should check, that the new manifold is geodesically complete, and the old manifold is not geodesically that's complete. So you can just calculate the geodesics of this particular metric, and you can see that, in fact, that this, all the, the, the space time that I give on you up here, up here, this manifold, if I just have x to 0 to infinity, in fact, you have a geodesics with finite length, or if you like, finite affine parameter. I'll just uh, say what is affine parameter in a second. And, the sec and what we have done is we just extended it through x equal to 0, and therefore obtain a metric which is uh, geodesically complete. Now, this may look a little bit familiar, so up to here everything is okay, I mean these are all very trivial examples, but it makes you think that just because you see that there is something problem, it doesn't mean that there is necessarily a problem, what we should do is to actually, of course if you, one possibility is the following, you sense that there is a problem and you can calculate curvature invariance like, like, like FAB, FAB, if a curvature invariant does blow up, then there is a problem, right? but, but, because it, but if it does not blow up, it doesn't mean that there is no problem. So we do not know that. So that is, that is the main point up here. So you can calculate the curvature invariant. If it blows up, then you know, there's a problem. Then we stop. That means that the space, this space time is that leaves a genuine singularity. But if the curvature invariant does not blow up, then we can see if, in fact, we can extend this manifold. So we might be able to extend it. We might not be extended, able to extend it. And a good idea is to use geodesic completeness. Now there is a simple sort of um, example up here, which is just take this flat metric and write it as in Cartesian coordinates as r squared d theta squared plus uh, dr squared, right? Just write it write in this particular coordinates. And again, the statement up here is that there is, it looks like there is a singularity r equal to zero because this is zero and therefore the metric becomes degenerate, it's not well defined. But we know that r equal to zero singularity is spurious. This is, just, this, this, is just spherical, this is just the spherical coordinates in two dimensions, and we know that we can just write down x to be equal to r cos theta, and y to be equal to um, y to be equal to r sine theta, and then this metric is just dx squared plus dx dy squared, and r equal to zero will correspond to x equal to zero, y equal to zero, and there is no problem here with this metric at all. So these were bad coordinates. I just want to tell you this, that these are bad coordinates. It's just that we've gotten used to uh, using them. They are bad coordinates. And keep in mind, yes, yes, I know they're bad. Even in doubt, I can always go to Cartesian coordinates and then check what happens up here. So sometimes we do this, and we maintain the bad coordinates because they're easier for calculations or whatever it is. And that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it at all. But if you are in doubt, then always find good coordinates with respect to which the space-time is, is complete. If I cut out r equal to zero point up here, saying that there's a bad coordinate, then in fact that space time it will, is not complete because you can just x direction geodesic and it is going to end at a finite distance at r equal to zero, right? Or y direction geodesic is going to end at finite distance. You start at y equal to y naught, go to y equal to zero, so only the length up here is just y naught and it's incomplete. And we see that it can be, you know, there's no problem at all. This was just a problem of the of these coordinates, we can extend the manifold by adding r equal to zero point, and there is no problem at r equal to zero point. So. Okay, now the third example is sort of the beginning of Lorentzian example. And this example will pay way to understanding what Kruskal did for this particular metric up here. And this Lorentzian example, you just write down the metric to be equal to minus z squared dt squared plus dz squared. <coughs> Those of you who might have sort of noticed that there is a kind of a similarity here. Z is like r and t is like theta up here, if you like. I mean, of course, there's a minus sign. That is because we're looking at a minus Lorentz in metric up here. So this metric also looks, in these coordinates, it looks like bad at z equal to zero. It looks singular at b equal to zero, and we want to know 
if it is in fact really singular or if it is not singular. Now the point was that for this examples, which were just Euclidean examples, we could just take any old geodesics and complete and see what happens, right? Because all geodesics are the same footing. You don't have time-like geodesics, space-like geodesics, null geodesics, etc. In two dimensions, and very often two dimensional spaces are going to be important. In two dimensions, what happens is that um, it is very convenient to use in the Lorenzian signature, it is very convenient to use null geodesics to test all these things. So this is, I'm not saying this as a theorem, I'm saying this as a strategy that we all use, that is standard thing to do. Uh, you get some unfamiliar metric, for example, in the 1980s, I was looking at a C metric, which was, given, which was discovered by Levi Civita. Ultimately, it turns out to be kind of describing two black holes, which are constantly accelerating with respect to each other. And again, looking at the form of the metric that was given, it was not at all obvious. So the question was, can we extend it? Can we do something? And this is the kind of tricks that we play. We look at null geodesics and then see that, in fact, yes, we can extend it and, and then see how much you can extend it and so on. So this is the, really the, the, the kind of a very standard tool in your toolbox that you should have. And that is really looking at null geodesics. But also in two dimensions, all metrics are locally conformally flat. Now this metric is in fact globally conformally flat because I can just take out the z squared as a conformal factor and I just get minus z squared dz upon z whole squared. Okay. I've not done anything, I've just written it in a different form which is conformally flat up here. And this is the conformal factor and this is a flat metric up here. So this tells us that we should define perhaps the, the, um, a new coordinate zeta to be equal to log of z or z is equal to e to the zeta. Um, therefore, um, uh, therefore, this coordinate will just be equal to, so then here I will get here e to the 2 zeta times minus d p squared plus d zeta squared. Okay, I've not done any real thing up here, it's just that I've written it manifestly flat. So this is manifestly flat. And this is a confounded factor. Of course, at z equal to zero, zeta becomes um, uh, 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 zeta becomes um, minus infinity. Therefore, this conformal factor goes to zero, and therefore the metric is actually bad. So I've not done anything new. I mean, the metric is still bad at, at uh, z equal to zero. Is that the singularity is, is sort of pushed pushed away at the um, uh, at the zeta equal to minus infinity? So this is a conformal factor. This is manifestly flat. And now, as I was telling you before, in two dimensions, it is convenient to use null coordinates. So we use, define new coordinates called u and v. So this little u, um, lowercase u, and lowercase u is just given by, by t minus zeta, and then v is given by t plus zeta. So remember, all this exercise, what are we trying to do? We are trying to understand the invariant structure of the metric that is given to you, of the space-time that is given to you. And that is what is essential to extract physics, right, in general relativity. So that is our goal up here. So little steps up here might look trivial, but really there is a soul to these little steps that you should keep in mind always. So if I do that, then of course minus d zeta squared plus minus dt squared plus uh, d zeta squared, that is just equal to, uh, uh, let's see, minus d u dv. This will be equal to minus, these are all little, du dv. And then I got e to the 2 zeta. And e to the 2 zeta, just from here, is equal to e to the v minus u. Again, so far I have not done anything. I kept the old manifold. I have not done the extension of the manifold at all. Um, but now I would like to know if in fact, but this manifold that we have got is geodesically complete. So this is again exercise for students. Check that this is that null geodesics are not complete. Now I have to say what I mean by this. 
So what you can do is you can look at the null geodesics of this metric up here. And so you would like to look at geodesics. So this is equal to zero. This is called affinely parameterized geodesics. If I take eta tilde A to be equal to alpha times eta A, then eta tilde A eta A, eta tilde B up here. If I just rescale it with the, this, this factor up here, so that will give me uh, alpha times eta A, eta A, alpha times eta B. So when alpha comes out, I get eta A, eta A, eta B, which is zero. When alpha stays in, I get here alpha times eta a grad a alpha times um, yeah, times um, eta b. So this alpha with this eta b just eta tilde b, and I get here eta a grad alpha. So if I just rescale this vector field by a function, I get a new vector field. That new vector field satisfies almost the geodesic equation. Sometimes this is called the geodesic equation that eta a grad a eta b is proportional to eta. But when it is affinely parameterized, then eta satisfies this condition up here. And then what you do is you look at affine parameter. This is not unique because you have freedom of choosing the origin where that the parameter is equal to zero. Let's call this affine parameter um, f say or what is a good name for it? Let's call it uh, U. So it could be one of these U's, for example. Um, then this affine parameter U up here. So then the statement is that, I mean, this has nothing to do with what I'm doing here. This is completely general. Let's just call it, so let's call it beta. So, so therefore, the statement is what it satisfies is just eta A, grad A, beta equal to 1. So you first look at affinely parameterized geodesic, that is to say eta a grad a eta b equal to zero, and then look at the affine parameter, which is just this beta, which is its parameter along the, the vector field. So eta a is just d by d beta. That vector field is just d by d beta. So you do that, and then we ask the question, is beta, is beta, is the geodesic complete? Does the parameter go from minus infinity to infinity? If you have a geodesic which is time-like or space-like, you can just ask, is the length of the geodesic go from minus infinity to infinity? But for null geodesic, the length is just zero. Therefore, we cannot use the notion of length. So we use this notion of affine parameterization. And if you use this notion also for time-like or space-like geodesics, you'll find that, in fact, if geodesic is complete with respect to its affine parameter, then it's also complete with respect to its length. So the two things are complete, are, are equivalent to each other. But for null geodesic, this goes up. So what I'm asking you is really calculate the null geodesics of this thing. And take a hint, they, they should be like proportional to d by du, if you like, and then and d by dv, because these are the null coordinates. And then say, say in fact, are they happy? If I just take those vector fields, you will find that with those vector fields, this is not a finely parameter. Right? You have to rescale them with some factor. And when you rescale them with the factor, you will find that the geodesics are not complete. The affine parameter does not run from minus infinity to infinity. But there is a very simple trick now. Namely, this form the metric suggests that we should absorb. You see, if the metric was just this, if we had a metric ds tilde squared, say, a uh, different metric, which is minus du dv. This is just a flat metric. This metric is just minus dt squared plus d zeta squared, where t is going from minus infinity to infinity. Zeta is going from minus infinity to infinity. And therefore, it's just a flat metric. And of course, complete, there's no problem at all. The problem is all coming because of this conformal factor. In other words, the curves, which are geodesic curves, of this metric are the same as the geodesic curves of this metric. Uh, null geodesic curves of this metric are the same as the null geodesic curves of this metric because the two are conformally related, related just by conformal factor. But the affine parameterization is not the same. In other words, 
something which looks affinely parameterized with respect to this metric, eta a grade eta b equal to zero, would not satisfy the eta a, with respect to this metric, if I take a vector b eta a, eta b equal to zero, then, then in fact eta a grade eta b is not equal to zero. It is proportional to eta b, and this is not zero. So the null geodesic with respect to the flat metric are not affinely, they are affinely parameterized with respect to the flat metric, but they are not affinely parameterized with respect to the physical metric that we have got because there's a confounding factor. And so you can check that, that that is the case. And that is the reason why you will have to multiply this vector field d by eta vector field by some suitable numbers, suitable function to actually get an affinely parameterized geodesic with respect to the physical metric. Is this point clear, Monica? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is all here. So that then we can just continue up here. And so the statement is that now the trick up here is, is a very simple trick. Just like what we did here, we just define new coordinates. So we can just define e to the v to be equal to big V. And I can just define e to the minus u to be equal to u, so let me just check it's minus u or minus minus u. Um, <coughs> minus. So we just define this, and then we just get here our metric d a squared, or the metric up here, is just equal to du dp. And this is perfectly fine now. And this metric is now really flat. We see that this metric is really flat. So the physical metric was conformally flat, but it is also flat. It's just regular flat up here. It's just that in this form, it is not obvious it is flat. This confound factor is very special. And in fact, the curvature of this metric is zero. We could not see it just looking at this, this form of the metric. But in this, just doing this, we see that the curvature is obviously zero. Right? Because just du dv is just looked like it just looks like the uh, Minkowski metric. But what are the ranges of u and v? Well, little u and little v, because t goes from minus infinity to infinity, and zeta also, little u and little v, they both go from minus infinity to infinity. But what about big u? Well, big u, or let us say big v first. What about big v up here? So. Um, right. So, when, when, when this is equal to infinity, big V is equal to infinity. When little v is equal to minus infinity, it is equal to zero. So, big V goes from zero to infinity. And big U, because the minus sign, goes from minus infinity to zero. So, what has happened is that when given the original metric, We are given the original metric, right, the original metric that was given to us up here, and we reformulate the metric in this particular form. But now we see that this big U and big V only cover <coughs> part of space time. Now, those of you who are looking at the to check about null geodesic completeness, it is obvious from this part that the null geodesics are incomplete because I find the parameterized. Geodesics. The vector field there, eta a, you just given by eta a dA equal to d by d big u. And so eta one equal to that and eta two a. Uh, so d by d u and d by d v, the big v, are just affine parameterized geodesics. And the affine parameter is incomplete because u and v just go from 0 to infinity and minus infinity to 0. So basically, I can start at some finite value of v and run to 0, and I will find that the geodesic is 
I, I meant my space time ended, but the geodesic affine parameter was just fine, was just finite. It was not infinite at all. But I mean, it's obvious now what we should do. We should obviously extend this, right? Let v go up to minus infinity, let u go to plus infinity. So this is a non trivial step that we take, which is extend the space time. So this is the step that we're, what we're, we're looking for, we just extend the space time and then see what happens when we extend the space time. Well, what, what is happening up here when we extend the space time? So to understand it, I mean, we can just draw this, but to sort of put it in the familiar language, at least to physics people, we can just introduce Cartesian coordinates. Think of them as null coordinates. So just as here, where t minus zeta and t, 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 t plus zeta to be the null coordinates, we can now introduce Cartesian coordinates, capital T and capital Z, such that, um, such that um, u is equal to t minus z upon 2, and v is equal to t plus z up to 2. So if you like, t, uh, so therefore, So therefore, t up here would just be equal to, this is right. so t up here would be equal to u plus v. So I should do the other way around. So t is equal to u plus v is equal to, yeah, and uh, z. So just introduce these Cartesian coordinates, and then when I use this, it's really following what you had done before, and then this metric d squared that we have, which is just minus d, d u d d v, just becomes minus d d squared, plus d z squared. These are the capital ones, t and z. So it just becomes this flat metric, and of course, t and z now, goes from minus infinity to infinity. Now again, students who are seeing this for the first time, this may be going a little bit fast, but please, please go to the notes and go through all the calculations in the notes, convince yourself that you, know, that you understand this subject very well. But this is really spelled out in great detail in the notes which are on the back page. So let us look at this coordinates T and Z, which are the final coordinates we are at. So here are the coordinates k and z. So it's a two-dimensional Minkowski space with metric to be minus minus dt square plus dz square. Could not be more boring than that, right? I mean just ordinary Minkowski space. The only non-boring thing is that it is it is an indefinite signature. I mean, okay, it's just a, and then u equal to zero and v equal to zero are just these curves. This is v equal to zero. This is u equal to zero because u is equal to t minus z. So u equal to zero is t equal to z. And then the other one is this. And what we're seeing up here is that the original manifold that we had, we started out with, the original manifold only covered v, which are positive, and u, which are negative. So the original manifold covered u negative. So in this region, But V is also positive. So, so the original manifold was only was only one quadrant of this Minkowski space. It was not all of Minkowski space. And what we did here via these extensions is to realize that that was just a stupid coordinate limitation of choosing bad coordinates up here that we really need to, we really could extend the manifold uh, without any problem, and then we get this bigger manifold up here. This is the original wedge. So now you can look at, I just leave this as an exercise, because it's pure algebra, and also done in detail in the, in the, in the notes, that not very surprisingly, we saw that there is a very si good similarity between this 
and this, right? Z was like R, and T is like theta. So T was an angular coordinate, okay, here. and here we have got signature which is minus plus. So whatever is angular becomes hyperbolic angular. So X, for example, is given by R cos theta. So here the statement will be that um, that Z up here, the good coordinates, is just given by uh, is just given by T. Is given by big Z is given by this big Z is given by little Z and it's kosher T and big T is given by little Z and sinh of T. It's very similar to the Cartesian coordinate that we saw. It's just that um, cos is replaced by cosh and sinh is replaced by uh, the sign is replaced by sinh of T. And then you can ask for what was the physics of the old manifold? The new manifold we know everything about. We have got time translation d by dt, capital T, space translation d by dz, and we have got a boost scaling vector up here. In the old manifold, we only see, because it depends on z, manifestly we only see that there is one killing vector field which is d by dt, little t up here. So we can ask what does that killing vector field here look like? So what does d by dt look like? So d by dt just looks like z d by dt. So you, you just do this coordinate transformations to make sure that this is correct and this coordinate transformation. It just looks like z by dt plus t d by dt. So this was a killing vector field. It's a killing vector field because the metric here manifestly does not depend on the time coordinate t. That's why it's a killing vector field. So that vector field, when you transform, looks like this. And this is a boost. <coughs> so our killing vector field d by dt is this vector field. It is just the hyperbolic rotation. In this case, the rotational killing vector field would look like x d by dy minus y d by dx. This is the killing vector field up here. So this will be the vector field d by dt. This is the vector field that will, and this is the rotation in the Cartesian coordinates up here. In the, in the, this is a rotation expressed in the Cartesian coordinate for a Euclidean metric. And we have got exactly the same thing, except that this minus sign is, is become a plus sign. And that is a difference between a rotation and a hyperbolic rotation, or if you like, a boost. So our killing vector field looks like this. And this killing vector field becomes null here. If I take this vector field TA, TA just TA is just defined by the, D by DT. So TA vector field has coordinates. The T little t coordinate is equal to 1 and little c coordinate is equal to 0. So that's obvious. Okay. So little TA. In little t and little z chart. So this killing vector field TA up here is not. So this is a null killing vector field. Or it's a vector field which becomes null on these boundaries up here. <coughs> and these boundaries on which a killing vector field becomes null, that called killing horizons. I write down the definition in a second. What exact definition is in the second up here. These are called killing horizons. So what we see up here is that T along this is this is the thing on which uh, little z is constant. Little z is constant. So little z is like the, this distance up here. Uh, this, is, this, is this, this is little z. And this little z is the proper distance. Uh, maybe I should say. Yeah, let, let me not get this. Okay, so, so d by dt is this, so therefore, and therefore t is like the angular coordinate, it actually changes up here, and z is like the radial coordinate. So this is the boost scaling back to field. Okay. And we see that the old manifold was incomplete because if I looked at d by dt, for example, 
it goes like that. D by dz vector field, capital Z vector field, big, big, looks like that. So obviously, if I take D by D vector field, I'm cutting across the boundary of the old manifold. The old manifold is really incomplete. Similarly, D by dz vector field, the space translation vector field, is incomplete. So this little quadrant of Minkowski space-time is often called Rindler wedge. which was the original manifold we started out with, we just didn't realize it. We realized very quickly that it was actually conformally flat, and then a little bit later we realized it's actually flat, but what we did not realize is that it's a flat piece of Minkowski space, but it's a proper flat piece. It's not all of Minkowski space, it's only a patch of Minkowski space. And that's what we sort of see here explicitly. So, very often, <laughs> For people like me, you know, working with coordinates is difficult. I sort of I do struggle a lot. But it is essential in some circumstances where you want to know how big is your manifold. The metric may be given to you in a plate, like Schwarzschild metric is given to us in a plate, but that may not be the most convenient way of actually writing the metric. Right? So we have to really struggle and see if in fact it is complete. So I just want to say one thing and then we'll quit, namely. What are the steps we had done up here? This is all again emphasized in the notes. The first is that you note that there is some problem somewhere. And what we want to know is, is this a real problem or is not a real problem? One way to look at it is to actually solve the geodesic equation, actually construct the geodesics, and in two dimensions, null geodesics is the best way to do it because the things are probably flat. So you look at the geodesic and see if, in fact, the, the space-time is geodesically incomplete. If it is actually geodesically complete, then that's it. If it's not geodesically complete, then you try to extend it. And two things we did. First was trivial, which is just use convenient coordinates. We don't change the manifold. Don't change the manifold. But then we arrive at somewhere, and then we see that, in fact, the manifold can be extended. The old manifold was a piece of the, of the, of the, of the, of the real possible manifold. And then we carry out this extension. Okay. The first thing is to look at where is the problem, check if it is geodesically complete or not, then do some simple manipulations if you can to make the manifold geodesically complete. That typically involves the extension of the old manifold. Okay, any questions? I don't pause too much in yeah, please don't like, I don't pause too much during the in the in future, I will pause much more. Uh, the reason is because this material is rather elementary and I just want to get quickly over it. As we go along and enter more and more difficult material, I will stop at many places and ask for questions. Please. Yeah. Um, so your definition of like a singularity, um, or at least like a, let's say, let's say problematic manifold, um, is one in which you have particles which uh, have a finite uh, length geodesic, right? That's a very uh, particle-based way of like describing singularities, while GR is field theory, so I was kind of wondering like this is actually, like does the notion of geodesically incomplete actually same thing about like solving the field equations. Yeah. Right. So the statement is that which field equations you mean the, the Einstein's equations? Right. So for example, Einstein's equations. We are already talking about solving the Einstein's equations themselves, right? So, so we so it's not uh, from beginning. Everything is about looking at solutions of Einstein's equation up here. And so the big question is whether if in fact you've got some geodesic incompleteness, is it a real singularity or not? That's the question we want to ask. Um, I, I think the key point I wanted to emphasize at the end of Schwarzschild, I wanted to emphasize this much more, was that we don't have a clean notion, which is written in a little three line as to what is a singularity in general relativity. I just want to emphasize that. There's no simple thing that this is what I mean by singularity. Uh, there are indications as to where the, the space time is singular. And a very strong indication is, is, is if it is geodesically complete. But typically then, if it is geodesically complete, you can just ask with respect to the field equations, okay, I got Einstein's equations up to this point up here. Can I extend it? Uh, now, the extensions that were carried out and uh, everywhere, they are, of course, such that you, you just, these are our analytical extensions, and therefore, of course, if it was Ricci tensor was zero before, the Ricci tensor is going to be zero afterwards. There's going to be a solution to field equations, no problem at all. Same thing is going to happen with Schwarzschild and Kerr. These are going to be analytic extensions across the boundary. But in general, 
it's a real issue. I mean, for example, um, when we actually get some singularities, for example, the rise to loss of solution and such thing, the question is, can you actually extend it beyond that? And then the question is, what extension do you want? Do you want extension which is C1, C2, C0? Is it extended in the sense of a distribution? Is it extended in the sense of... So these big questions become much, much more important. And these are kind of frontier questions in geometric analysis. People work on it actively. There is a debate about these issues currently about, you know, whether, whether we can actually extend across the Cauchy horizons. Uh, these are all, I'm talking ahead of myself, but uh, uh, Cauchy horizons in rice and Osdam and curves solutions and such things, because if you allow extension to be just a C0 metric, then the answer is yes. But if you don't allow it to be, you want it to be at least a C2 extension, then the answer is no. So these are interesting frontier questions. So what we are doing up here is really the zeroth order notion of what is singularity. And what we are seeing is that simple things which look singular need not be singular, we can extend it. So I'm avoiding the hard questions of analysis here by just saying that, well, there's a larger manifold over which everything is clearly completely verified. Okay. So we are going to meet on Friday here, and again just for an hour, but for next Monday, including the Monday the 15th, I hope nobody has an objection. If you do, please, and if you're embarrassed about saying it, send me an email. We can cancel the class on Monday. So on, on mon from Monday on, we are going to meet at 10 o'clock, 10 to 11.10. Thank you.